Oversee Under Stone, Day 7, Part 1, Chapter 13. The Grey House was as calm and empty as it had been when they left. Barney, Simon shouted up the stairs. Barney, his voice dwindled away uncertainly. He can't be inside, Jane said. The key was still in its hiding place. Oh, Simon, what can have happened to him? She turned back anxiously to the open front door and stared down the hill. Barney came back down the dark, shadowy hall to join her in the pool of sunlight. He must have missed us in the harbor, but surely he'd have come back here after that. There isn't a soul about down there now. They've all gone after the band. That awful bill passed us. You don't think. No, Simon said hastily. Anyway, Barney's got Rufus with him. He can't get into much trouble. You wait. He'll be back soon. I expect he's found Gamary, and they're looking for us. He was turning back into the house when Jane suddenly shouted joyfully, Look, you're right! Rufus was loping up the hill towards them, a swift streak of red on the gray road, but they could see no one behind him. Jane called, and he raised his muzzle and trotted more quickly, up the steps between their legs and into the house. Then he stood facing them, his long ribbon of tongue wet dangling over his jaws. But his tail was down, and there was none of the bouncing, barking delight with which he usually came home. No sign of Barney, Jane came slowly in from the doorstep. She looked down at Rufus. What is it then? What happened? The dog took no notice of her. He stood there apathetically, his eyes blank. Even when they had given him a drink of water <clears throat> and taken him into the room overlooking the harbor, he still gave no sign that he knew where he was home. It was as if he were thinking of something quite different. I expect it's the heat, Simon said. He sounded unconvinced. Come on, there's nothing we can do except wait. The yacht's still down in the harbor anyway. That doesn't mean anything, Jane said miserably. Well, it does mean, but Simon had no chance to explain. Jane had clutched his arm nervously. He saw that she was staring at Rufus. They could never explain it afterwards. It was as Rufus had been lying there listening for something, and it had, and had caught, last caught the thing he was waiting for, though he, they knew that they had heard no sound at all. He raised his head, his eyes so wide open that the eye whites were showing, and stood up slowly in a way more like an old man than a dog. His ears were pricked and his muzzle raised high, pointing straight at something they could not see. He began to walk very slowly and deliberately towards the door. Mesmerized, Simon and Jane followed. Rufus went out into the hall until he reached the front door and stood waiting. He did not turn his head. He simply stood there rigid, looking ahead at the door as if quite certain that they knew what he wanted them to do. Simon reached forward, glancing nervously down at the long, straight red back, and opened the door. Then they stood on the step, watching in complete bewilderment as Rufus stalked with the same ageless confidence straight ahead across the road. When he reached the other side, he leapt up with a quick light flurry to stand erect on the wall, which kept the road from the sheer 60-foot drop down to the harbor side. He seemed to be looking out at the sea. He's not going to jump, Jane jerked in alarm, but found that she was whispering. And then they heard the noise that they never afterwards forgot. Barney knew, dimly, that he had been taken out of the big silent house and driven away in a car, and that now they were talk walking with a group with the noise of the sea somewhere near. But he was not certain how many of them there were, or where they were taking him. Since the moment in the shadowy room when those blazing dark eyes had glared into his face, he had been conscious of nothing except that he what that was he was to do was what he was told. He no longer had any thoughts of his own. It was a strange, relaxed feeling as if he were comfortably half asleep. There could be no argument now, no fighting. He knew only that the tall, dark figure walking at his side wearing a wide-brimmed hat, black hat was his master. Master? Who else had used the word that day? Come, Barnabas, said the hypnotic, deep voice above him. We must hurry. The tide is going out. We must reach the yacht. Reach the yacht, said Barney dreamily to himself. We're going out on the sea. That was the sea he could smell, the water lapping beside them at the edge of Tewesic Harbor. Far away as if, as if it came from a great height, he heard Polly Withers' voice saying urgently, Anyone can see us from the road up by the house. They'll see us. I know they will. Polly, said the deep voice, I am the one who sees. If our old Cornish friend has done her work well, there will be no one there. And if the other two children have been <clears throat> let slip, well, are they a match for us? Somewhere Mr. Withers laughed, soft and sinister. Barney walked on like a machine. The air was warm and thick. He could feel the sun fierce on his face. He had heard them talking ever since they left the house, but nothing they said seemed to have meaning for him anymore. He was not frightened. He had forgotten Simon and Jane. He was somehow floating outside himself, watching the mi with mild interest while his body walked along, but feeling nothing at all. And then, like the sudden snapping of a bow, the noise came. Into the air over their heads, a dog howled, a long, weird note, so unexpected and anguished that for a moment they all stopped dead. It echoed slow through the harbor, a freezing, inhuman wail that had in it all the warning and terror that ever was in the world. 
even Mr. Hastings stood listening, paralyzed. And the Barney who was outside Barney, floating half detached in the air, felt the noise wake him up with a savage jolt. He looked up and saw Rufus standing above him, outlined red against the sky, with the sound still throbbing from his throat. And suddenly he knew where he was, and that he must get away. He swung round on his heel, ducked under the arms that grabbed too late to catch him, and raced along the quay towards the road. The hill was empty, drained of people with, by the carnival procession, and he was 25 yards clear of the confused group on the quay before they could properly begin to give chase. He heard the shouts and pounding feet behind him and flung himself up the hill towards the gray house. Simon and Jay sta Jane stared in amazement from the steps. Suddenly there had been Rufus's blood-chilling howl, now suddenly Barney, with four threatening figures at his heels. They ran instinctively down the steps towards him and then swung back in alarm at the worst sound of all. Behind them, the door of the gray house had slammed and the key was inside. Barney staggered up to them and Rufus came bounding down from the, from the wall. Jane said, panic-stricken, which way? Simon turned frantically to get to the, wooden, to the great wooden door in the wall, which was the gray house's side entrance. Often, it was kept locked. He pressed the latch, his heart thumping. Relief flooded over him in a wave as the door opened and he pushed it wide. Quick, he yelled. The four figures, pounding grim and intent at Barney's heels, were only a few steps behind. Jane and Barney shot inside the door, with Rufus a swift red flurry among their feet. The wall itself seemed to shake as Simon slammed the door shut and hurriedly pushed home the three big horn iron bolts. <clears throat> they ran up the cold, narrow little alley between the side of the gray house and the house next door, and paused at the far end. Outside, footsteps skidded up to the door. They saw the latch raise, rise as someone on the other side pressed it. It rattled angrily and there was a lump or thump against the door. Then there was silence. Suppose they climb over the wall, Jane whispered fearfully. They couldn't possibly, Simon whispered back. It's too high. Perhaps they'll break the door down. Those bolts are jolly strong. Anyway, people would see them and get suspicious. Listen, they've gone away. They all strained their ears. There was no sound from the door at the other end of the alley. Rufus looked up at them inquiringly and whined, whistling plaintively through his nose. What are they doing? They must be up to something. Quick, Simon said decisively, we've got to get away from the house before they have time to get round the back. They'll have it surrounded soon. In panic, they ran into the little back garden and up through the knee-high grass to the hedge at the top. Rufus bounded round them, cheerfully, jumping to lick Barney's face. He seemed to have forgotten the uncanny impulse that had made him utter that one long lost howl, and now he's behaving as if everything was were just a great game. I hope that dog's going to keep quiet, Jane said anxiously. Simon peered through the gap in the hedge. He will, Barney said. He bent down and cupped one hand over Rufus's long red muzzle, murmuring to him under his breath. Simon straightened. It's all clear. Come on. One by one, they slipped out of the garden into the road that curved round behind the houses from the harbor along the edge of Kamar Head. Oh, Jane said in sudden anguish. If only we knew where Gamary had gone. Barney said horrified. Didn't you find him? What about Mrs. Pock? No, we didn't find him. We did see Mrs. Pock, but we couldn't get to her through the crowd. Didn't you see him? Why were they chasing you? Where did you come from? We thought something awful must have happened when Rufus came back on his own, but we didn't know where to look for you. Wait a minute, Barney said. The shock of waking from his bewitched days was turning into an enormous sense of urgency. A dozen things that he had heard in the last hour were dodging about in his mind, and he and as he began to see their meaning, he was feeling more and more alarmed. Simon, he said earnestly, we've got to get the grail. Now, even with great uncle, without great uncle Mary, there isn't time to look for him or wait or anything. I think they're very nearly on top of it, only not quite. That's why they wanted me. First thing is to get away from here, Simon looked about him wildly. They could come up either way from the harbor. We'll have to get off the road and hide in that field at the back of the headland. The land doesn't slope there. We ought to be able to keep hidden. <clears throat> they crossed the road and came out into the fields at the bottom of Kamar Head. The sun blazed high up in the sky still, beating down with a heat that pressed on, on them like a giant hand. But now even Jane was worrying about the chances of sunstroke now. As they reached the hedge on the far side of the first field, they heard voices. They scrambled hastily through the hedge without pausing to look round and flattened themselves in the long grass on the other side. Barney slid his arm apprehensively over Rufus's back, but the dog lay quiet with his long pink tongue lolling out. Nobody saw quite where they came from, but suddenly the figures were standing there on the road. Mr. Withers, slight and stooping a little, darting his head about like a weasel. The boy Bill, walking wary and belit... <coughs> Lydrant in his bright shirt, and towering over them both, the tall, menacing figure in black, a dark gash across the heat-wavering summer day. Watching, Simon thought suddenly of the desperate day when threatening feet were pounding after him, down a lonely road, and he turned his eyes away from the man. 
The girl's not there, Barney hissed. She must be watching the front in case we tried to come out that way again. Down on the road, the little group stood for a moment irresolute. Bill turned and peered across the field, straight towards the hedge. The three children flattened themselves closer to the ground, hardly daring to breathe. But Bill looked away again, apparently satisfied. Withers looked across the field as well and said something to him. The boy shook his head. The tall figure in black had been standing a little way apart, motionless. It was difficult to tell which way he was looking. All at once, he raised his arm, pointing seaward to the rising bulk of Kamar Head. He seemed to be talking earnestly. What are they going to do? Jane whispered. Cramp was beginning to nod agnostically as at her right leg, and she was longing to move. If they're going to, to the end of the headland, we're sunk, Simon said low and strained. How many more of them are there, for goodness sake? That tall man, Jane stared at him through erratic leaf starred gaps in the hedge. She could not see his face, but a cold sense of familiarity was beginning to grow in her mind. Then, as she gazed, he took off his wide black hat for a moment to brush his hand across his forehead, and suddenly she knew the shape of the head with a thick, dark hair. The pattern of twigs and grass and sunlight swirled before her eyes, and she clutched at Simon's arm. Simon, it's him again. It's... I know that, Simon said. The moment he came around the corner, I knew. I thought you did. He's the boss of all of them, Barney whispered in the same urgent undertone. His name's Hastings. That's right, Jane said faintly. Hastings, the vicer. Barney wriggled <clears throat> a little in the grass to stare at her. He's not the vicer. He is. I saw him at the viceridge. Oh, you remember. Is it a big rambling sort of house, all neglected, Barney said slowly, with a long drive and a room full of books? It was Jane's turn to stare. I remember saying, saying about the books, but not about the drive. How did you? Barney said with the utmost conviction. I don't care what you say. He isn't the vicer. I don't know what he is, but he isn't that. He can't possibly be. There's something perfectly beastly about him. He's like everything Gamary said about the other side. You can sort of feel it, looking at him. And he says things, keep down, Simon said abruptly. They all dropped their heads into the grass and lay silent for a long moment while the sun beat down on their backs and scorched the skin behind their knees. <clears throat> and the cool long grass along the edge of the hedge tickled their cheeks. Rufus stirred and grunted and was quiet again. He had fallen asleep. In a little while, Simon nervously raised his head a few inches from the ground, hearing nothing but the call of one faraway gull high up in the sky. He had seen three figures turn and move across the field, and for a moment he had thought they were caught in a trap. But there was no one now on the road where they had stood, and no one in the silent stretch of the field. They've gone, he whispered exultingly. <clears throat> but Barney and Jane raised their heads too, slowly and cautiously. Look, Jane propped herself on one elbow and pointed out to the coast. There they were, the tall black strutting figure and the two smaller ones, one on either side, bobbing out of sight along the side of Kamar Head. Oh, Barney rolled over on his back and groaned with despair. We're cut off. How can we get out on the headland now? Jane sat up, wincing as she stretched her cramped legs. She said despondently, I don't see what there is to get worked up about. We can't do anything. We found where the grail is, but we can't get at it anyway. If there is a bottom entrance, it's under the sea, and the hole we found at the top is too narrow to get through, even if we had a rope. Barney said, yelping, but they'll be able to. I know they will. That man can do anything. He seems to have things planned before he even knows they're going to happen. And if they find the hole in the rocks. But they couldn't go down any more than we could, Jane said reasonably. And they couldn't get in from the bottom either unless they've got diving suits on the yacht. Anyway, she added without much conviction, we aren't really absolutely sure the grail's there at all. But we are. We, You know we are. Barney's anxious frustration was mounting unbearably. we got to stop them. Even if we can't do anything ourselves, we've got to stop them. Don't be silly, little boy, Jane said, irritated by disappointment. We'll just have to let them go and keep out of their way until we find Great Uncle Mary. There isn't a thing we can do. There is one thing, Simon said. His voice sounded muffled and rather gruff, as it always did when he was trying not to be excited. They looked at him, and Jane raised an eyebrow skeptically. Simon said nothing. He was sitting, hugging his knees, frowning out across the field. Well, go on, then. The tide. The tide? What do you mean? The tide's out. Well, what's so marvelous about that? I know it is, Barney said wonderingly. You could see the mud down in the harbor, but Simon was not listening. Jane, you remember what Mr. Penhollow said down in the harbor about the tide being low? Oh, yes, Jane began to look less gloomy. Yes, that's right. It goes very low today, he said. Spring tide, right round the rocks. You can walk right round the rocks, Simon said. So what, demanded Barney. If we could walk right round the rocks, Simon said with careful patience, we could walk right round the bottom of Kamar Head. Jane interrupted, catching him. And the cave, the underwater entrance. When we heard the noise of the sea coming up the hole this morning, the tide was high. So the waves were still coming over the entrance. But don't you see, Barney? 
with a special low tide that uncovers all the rocks down there and may uncover the entrance as well, and we should be able to get in. Barney's face was a comical mixture of exp expressions. Blankness dissolving into excitement and then into alarm. Gosh, come on then, let's get down there. He jumped to his feet and then wailed. But we can't. There's one of them watching the harbor and the other three out on the headland. How can we get down there without being seen? I've thought of that too. Simon was pink with importance. Just a minute ago, there's the other side. The bay on the other side of the headland where we bathe from. <clears throat> we can get across the fields to it from here without them seeing us unless they're actually out by the standing stones looking down in that direction. If they look down, we've had it. But it's the only way I can see. They won't be, Jane said confidently. They wouldn't expect us to go down there. They'd be watching the harbor side. Come on, we've got to, go, to, got to be quick. Quicker than ever now. The tide was still going out when they were up over the harbor, I think. But it may turn any moment. I wish we knew exactly when. Barney, with Rufus roused and leaping round him again, was already several yards across the field. He halted suddenly, looking troubled, and turned back slowly. There's still Great Uncle Mary. He'll never find us now. He'd, he'll be worried stiff. He didn't bother much about worrying us stiff when he disappeared this morning, Simon said shortly. Oh, but all the same. Look, Simon said, I'm the oldest and I'm in charge. I've got to, I. it's got to be the Mary or the Grail we look for. Barney, there isn't time for both. And I say we go after the Grail. So do I, said J Jane said. Oh, well, said Barney. And when he went on over the field, secretly relieved to be able to accept commands. He felt he had had enough to of being the lone hero that day to last him for years so that his private dreams of sol solitary bold knights in shining armor would never be quite the same again. They were all three hot and breathless by the time they reached the beach in the next bay from Truisic on the other side of Kamar Head, but they saw to their relief that the tide had obviously not yet begun to come back in. The sea, team, sea seemed to be miles away, over a vast stretch of silver-white sand unscarred by footprints under the sun. And as they looked eagerly along the side of the headland, they could see rocks uncovered at its foot, before the waves had always washed up against the cliff, even at the lowest side. Their feet sank into the soft, dry sand at the top of the beach. Barney flopped down and began to unstrap one sandal. Wait a minute, I want to take my shoes off. Oh, come on, Simon said impatiently. You only have to put them back on again when we get to the rocks. I don't care. I'm taking them off now all the same. Anyway, I'm tired. Simon groaned and whacked the telescope case against his knee in exasperation. More than ever now, he was determined to carry the manuscript wherever they went, and the case was hot and damp in the palm of his hand. Jane sat down on the sand beside Barney. Come on, Simon. Have a rest just for five minutes. It won't hurt, and I'm jolly hot as well. Not altogether unwillingly, Simon let his knees give way and collapsed to lie flat on his back. The sun blazed down into his eyes, and he turned over quickly. Golly, what a day. I could do with the swim. He looked longingly out at the sea, but his eyes swiveled at once back to the rocks. There's even more uncovered than I thought there would be. Look, it's going to be easy as anything to walk around the cliff. It looks pretty wet in places where the tide's left some water behind, but we can get through that easily enough. So you'll have to take your shoes off as well, said Barney triumphantly. He hung his sandals round his neck by their straps and wiggled his toes luxuriously in the sand, looking at the gulls wheeling and faintly calling high over the beach. Then he stiffened. Listen. I heard that too, Simon said, looking up curiously. Funny. It sounded like an owl. It was an owl, Barney said, peering up at the towering side of the headland. It came from up there. I thought you only heard owls at night. You do. And if they come out in the daytime, they get mobbed by all, by all the other birds because they eat their young. We studied it at school. Well, the gulls don't seem to be taking any notice, Barney said. He looked up at the dark specks lazily sailing to and fro over the sky. Then he glanced around the beach. Hey, where's Rufus? Oh, he's around somewhere. He was just here a minute ago. No, he isn't, Barney said, or stood up. Rufus, Rufus, he whistled on the long, lilting note that the dog always answered to. Behind them, they heard a bark, and they looked up at the beach towards the sloping field to see Rufus on the edge of the grass, facing away from the sea, but with his head turned to look back at them. Barney whistled again and patted his knee. The dog did not move. What's the matter with him? He looks frightened. Has he hurt himself? I hope not. Barney ran up the beach and took Rufus by the collar, fondling his neck. The dog licked his hand. Come on, boy, Barney said softly. Come on, then. There's nothing wrong. Come on, Rufus. He tugged gently at the collar, moving back towards Simon and Jane, but Rufus would not move. He whined, straining away from the beach. His ears were pricked uneasily, and when Barney pulled more impatiently at his collar, he turned his head and gave a low warning growl. Puzzled, Barney relaxed his grip. As he did so, the dog suddenly jerked as if he had heard something, growled again, and slipped out of his grasp to trot swiftly away over the grass. 
Barney called, but he went on without a pause, head bent, <clears throat> tail between his legs, loping away in a straight line until he disappeared around the side of the headland. Barney came slowly back down the beach. Did you see that? Something must have frightened him. I bet he's run all the way home. Perhaps it was that owl, Simon said. I suppose it might have been. Hey, listen, there it is again. Barney looked up. It is up on the headland. This time they all heard it. A long husking wail drifting slowly down. As she listened, Jane felt all warning instincts muttered deep inside her mind. For a moment she could not understand. She looked up, troubled at the looming mass of Kamar head and at the tops of the standing stones outlined against the sky. Stupid bird, Simon said idly, lying down on his back again. Think it's night time. Think... Thinks it's night time. So I have to go back to bed. As if something exploded inside her head, Jane remembered. Simon, quick, it's not a bird at all. It's not an owl, it's them. The other stared at her. Jane jumped to her feet, the lulling warmth of sun and sand, forgotten in a sudden new panic. Don't you remember that night up on the headland by the standing stones we heard some owls hoot and that was why Gamary went off to look? Because he thought they didn't sound right. And it wasn't owls, it was the enemy. Oh, quick, perhaps they've seen us. Perhaps that was a signal from one of them to tell the others were here. Simon was up on his feet before she had finished. Come on, Barney, quick. Away from the revealing emptiness of the beach, they dashed towards the rocky side of the headland and sand, the sand squeaking against their feet as they ran. Barney's sandals bounced upon his chest, kicking him. Jane lost the hair ribbon from her ponytail and her hair flowed loose, tickling the back of her neck. Simon ran, clutching the telescope case grimly, like a relay runner's baton. They made straight for the cliff and paused under its great gray height, to look fearfully back at the grassy slope rising behind the beach. But there was no sign of anyone coming after them, and they heard no owl cry. Perhaps they didn't see us after all. I bet they can't really see this beach from anywhere on top of the headland. Well, we've got to hurry all the same. Come on, or the tide will turn and beat, it, beat us to it. They were still running on sand alongside of the, the cliff towards the end of the headland and the sea. Then they came to the rocks, and they began to climb. The rocks were perilous to cross. At first they were dry and fairly smooth, and it was easy to scramble from one gray jagged ridge to the next, skirting the small pools where anemones spread their tentacles like feathers, feathered flowers among seaweed leaves, and shrimps darted transparent to and fro. But soon they came to the rocks that were uncovered only at the lowest spring tides. Great masses of seaweed grew, shining, still wet in the sun, slippery brown weed that squelched and popped under their feet, giving way sometimes without warning, to drop them into a pool. They came to a long stretch of water left trapped in the rocks. Barney, still determinedly barefoot, was trailing some way behind the other two. They waited at the edge of the water as he picked his way gingerly towards them. Ow, he said as he trod on a winkle. You do put your sandals on, Jane said imploringly. It doesn't matter about getting them wet. Ours are stopping already. You might step on anything in this pool and cut your feet to bits. Barney said with his surprising meekness due to having stubbed three toes. All right. He perched on a jutting rock and unhooked his sandals from his round from round his neck. Seems silly to put your shoes on to go paddling instead of taking them off. You can call it paddling, Simon said darkly. There might be all sorts of ravenous deep fish left in here. Mr. Penhouse says the sea is terrifically deep just off the headland. He gazed in the mass of bulbous, bulbous brown seaweed floating on the surface of the pool. Oh well, here goes. They splashed through the weed, keeping close to the cliff and catching nervously at the rock to keep their balance. Simon, first in line, reached out warily with his forward foot, stirring the water so that the seaweed swirled cold and clammy against his skin. The bottom of the pool seemed fairly smooth, and he went more confidently with the others following behind. Then suddenly, his probing foot met no resistance, and before he could throw his weight backwards, he had slipped down waist deep in water. Jane, last in line, squealed involuntarily as she saw him drop. Barney held out a hand to Simon, suddenly a much shorter figure than himself. It's all right, Simon said, more surprised than damaged. After the first shock, the water fell pleasantly cold on his sun-baked legs. He moved carefully forward, and after a couple of steps, fell rocking against his knees under the water of the pool. He hauled himself up, splashing like a stranded fish, and in a few moments was only ankle-deep in water again. It's a sort of underwater trough. It goes right up to the cliff. Be careful, Bar Barney. Feel with your toes a bit further out and see if there are any footholds there. There might be some sticking up under the water, like stepping stones. I went down before I had a chance to feel. If there aren't any, you have to come across the way I did, only slower. Barney prodded carefully about with one foot beneath the water and its swaying carpet of seaweed, but even farther away from the cliff, he could feel only the edge of the underwater ridge, beyond it nothing. I can't feel anything to tread on at all. You have to go down then, lower yourself into it. 
We might as well have gone swimming after all, Barney said nervously. He crossed with both hands on the bottom until he was sitting in the water with the, his legs dangling over the hidden crevasse and let himself slip down. The water almost <clears throat> was almost over his shoulders when he felt his feet on the firm rock. He had forgotten how much taller Simon was. He waded across and Simon hauled him out into the shallow water. Barney's shorts, wet and dark, clung heavily to his thighs and he bent to detach odd fronts of seaweed that had twined themselves around his legs. Almost at once he felt the heat of the sun begin to dry his skin, leaving behind only the rasp of salt. Jane followed in the same way, and altogether they splashed across the last few shallow feet of the pool to where the rocks jutted out dry among the brown mounds of seaweed again. I do wish we knew about the tide, Simon said anxiously to Jane. Barney had gone eagerly slipping and slithering over the rocks ahead of them. Jane looked towards the sea. It lapped mildly against the edge of the rocks a few yards away leaving a natural pathway all around the bottom of the cliff. It certainly hasn't moved. It might be going out still. I shouldn't worry yet. We must be nearly there. Well, keep an eye on it. It's that deep, but I'm deep, deep bit I'm worried about. When the water does start coming in, it'll come into the pool first of all, and it won't have to fill out far for us not to be able to get back the way we came. It'd be over Barney's head in no time. Jane Blunt blanched and looked ahead at her younger brother now scrambling on all fours oh simon do you think we should have left him behind simon grinned i'd like to see have seen you try don't worry it'll be all right just so long as we watch the tide looking back jane suddenly realized how far they had come they stood now on the rocks at the very tip of the headland the small distant sounds of the land no longer drifted out from the beach and there was nothing but the gentle sigh of the sea it was almost as if they were cut off already then barney yelled in excitement hey look quick come here i found it he was standing close to the cliff some yards ahead, almost hidden by a rock. They could see him pointing towards the cliff face, and in an instant they had forgotten the tide, and they jumped and slithered over pools and rocks towards Barney, bladder rack top popping under their feet like machine gun fire. It's not very big, he called as they came up. Simon and Jane saw the deep cleft in the rock only when they were very close. It was not the kind of cave they had pictured in their minds. Narrow and triangular, it rose barely high enough for Barney to stand up right inside, and they themselves would certainly have to crouch to go in. Rough boulders lay heaped around the entrance and water dripped from wet green weed coating the roof. They could not see the very very far and very far inside. Jane said doubtfully, Are you sure this is it? Of course it is, Barney said positively. There couldn't be more than one. I don't see why not. Neither do I, said Simon said, but I think this is the one, all right. Look up above. You can just see a sort of green triangle at the top of the cliff where the grass grows over the edge by the rocks. We must be di almost directly in line with the place where that hole comes out up there. Jane looked and looked down again, quickly shaken by the unnerving height of the cliff leaning over them out of the sky. I suppose so. Barney peered into the darkness. It isn't a cave at all, really. Just a hole, like at the top. Poof! He sniffed critically. It smells all seaweedy and salty, and the sides are all wet and green and dripping. Good job we're wet already. I don't like it, Jane said suddenly, staring hard at the dark entrance so small in the vast mass of the cliff. What do you mean you don't like it? Gives me the creeps. We can't go in there. You can't, you mean, Simon said. You'll have to keep watch in case the tide turns, but I can. What about me? Barney demanded indignantly. I found it. Do you want to? said Jane in horror. With a grail in there, who wouldn't? Be much better if I tried, he said persuasively to Simon. I'm the smallest, and it's jolly narrow. You might get stuck and never get out again. Oh, don't, said Jane. If you go in, I'm going in after you, Simon said. Okay, Barney said cheerfully. He had been so un <clears throat> unutterably relieved ever since he found himself free of the clutches of the sinister Mr. Hastings that nothing else in comparison seemed frightening at all. I wish we'd brought a flashlight, though, he gazed spe speculatively into the cave. With a few feet of the entrance, it was black and impenetrable. I wish we'd brought a rope, Jane said unhappily. Then, if you did get stuck, I could pull you out. Simon put his hands in his pocket, looking up at the sky, and began to whistle nonchalantly. They stared at him. Well, what's the matter with you? Good job someone's in the family got brains, Simon said. Who, you? I don't know what you'd do without me. Oh, come on, Jane said impatiently. You haven't got a rope or a flashlight, so don't pretend you have. I jolly nearly have, Simon delved into his pocket of his shorts. You know when we went through our pockets up there this morning to see if we had some string and we only had a, that cotton of yours? Well, I thought we ought to be, to be a bit better equipped just in case. So when we were back at the house, I pinched some of Father's fishing line. He didn't take it all with him. His hand emerged from his pocket, clutching a tight wound wad of thin brown line. That's as tough as any rope. 
I never thought of that, Jane said, with, with new respect. I still got that old bit of candle, too. But I bet you haven't still got your matches, Jane groaned. No, I haven't. They were in my duffel, and I left it at home. Oh, bother. I thought you would, Simon said, and with the smug flourish of a conjurer, he produced a box of matches and the candle stump from his shirt pocket. Then his face fell. Oh, gosh, they've got wet. It must have been splashed when I slipped in that pool. The wick of the candle's soaking. It won't be any good. Still, the matches are all right. They'll do fine, Barney said encouragingly. That's smashing. Come on. Simon took the telescope case from where he had tucked it under his arm and handed it to Jane. You'd better take charge of the manuscript, Janey. If I drop it in there, we'd never find it again. He looked out again at the sea. The rocks where they stood were even more like, <clears throat> like a causeway here, stretching out almost flat from the base of the cliff into the water. Only one hump of gray rock stood alone near the entrance of the cave. The water still lapped gently at the edge, six or seven yards away, no nearer no, and no further than it had been when they first left the beach. <clears throat> Simon wondered nervously how much time was left before the tide would turn. I reckon we've got about half an hour. He said slowly. After that, we shall have to get away quick before the tide catches us. Come here, Barney, and hold still. He found the loose end of the roll of fishing line and tied it securely around Barney's waist. If you're going to go first, I can hold on to the line behind you. You think he ought to, Jane said. Barney turned around and glared at her. Well, I'm not awfully keen on the idea, said Simon, but he's right about it being narrow. He may be the only one who can get properly inside. It's all right. I won't lose him. Here. He handed Jane the roll of line. Don't let it go slack. And don't keep it too tight, said Barney, making for the entrance, or you'll cut my middle my middle in half. Jane looked at her watch. It's nearly five o'clock. When you've been in there ten minutes, I'll pull on the line twice to tell you. Ten minutes, said Barney in scorn. We may have to go in for miles. You might suffocate, said poor Jane. That's a good idea, Simon said quickly, glancing at her face. You pull twice, and if I pull back twice, it means we're all right, but we're staying in there. If I pull three times, it means we're coming out. And if I pull three times, it means you've got to come out because the tides turn. Fine. And four poles from either end means a distress signal. <clears throat> not, not, Simon added hastily, that there's going to be any need for it. All right, Jane said. Oh, dear. Don't be long. Well, we shall have to go slowly, but don't get in a flap. Nothing's going to go wrong. Simon patted her on the back and followed as Barney, straining eagerly at the line around his waist like a dog on a leash, waved one hand briefly and disappeared into the mouth of the cave.